Well, this morning we are concluding this series that we've been calling Just a Kid from Where. We're asking the question, who's the kid in the manger? And if you have driven through our neighborhood or maybe even just around Talmadge Circle, you've seen this nativity scene set up. It's a pretty common picture around Christmas. Uh, shepherds and angels and kind of Mary and Joseph all looking down at this baby, this baby that's called Jesus. And so we're asking the question, who is that kid? What's the big deal about him? What's the big deal about uh, that scene? Why go to all the trouble to celebrate that birth? In fact, that's the question that John is inviting us to ask with him in the Gospel of John. He's asking this question, who is Jesus? Because he knew Jesus personally, and when he sets out to write his story of the life of Jesus, uh, he's been listening to the questions that people are asking. They've been uh, trying to wrap their minds around who Jesus was and what he did and what it means for them. And so when he sets out to write his story of the life of Jesus, he actually tells us at the end why he's written it. He says in John chapter 20, I have written these things so that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you might have life in his name. He's saying that if you really consider who Jesus is, if you look at who he is and who he said he was, and you believe in him, it will change your life forever. And so he is inviting you to ask that question with him. Who is Jesus? And so for the past several weeks, we've been looking at the first chapter of John's story in John chapter 1. Because John skips the nativity. He skips Christmas and he goes all the way back to the beginning. And he says, let me tell you who Jesus is and what he's been doing all along. And so we've seen so far that John says that Jesus is God himself. He is the second person of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, there at the very beginning of everything. He is God's Son, which means He perfectly represents who God is. And last week we saw that Jesus brings us grace and truth. He brings us the truth that we can't get to God on our own, but the grace to take us to God with Him. And this morning we're going to look at just one verse in John chapter 1, verse 14. It's a verse that changes everything. And so if you are watching this, if you want to pull it up, whether you've got a Bible close by or you want to Google John 1, 14, uh, we're going to read this together and talk about what it means uh, for who Jesus is and what, uh, how we should live our lives. So John chapter 1, verse 14. Uh, read along with me, if you will. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. This is God's word for us this morning. You know, one of the hardest parts about 2020, and there's been a lot of hard parts about 2020, uh, but it's been the fact that all of our relationships are different. Right? Every relationship that you have has something between you and that other person now, whether it's a mask uh, with a friend or it's uh, a piece of plexiglass between you and the cashier, whether it's a window between you and a loved one, or a screen between you and your church family or another group that you belong to. Uh, that right now, every relationship is between something. There is some screen that we have to go through or some mask that we have to talk through. I mean, even for us uh, as a church, you remember what it was like to share the same space together, right? to be in this room together. There's something important about being in person. There's something that just a screen and watching someone and looking at someone through a screen, you just can't quite get who they are. You don't kind of feel what they're feeling or, or kind of sense their emotions or, or there's all kinds of nonverbals that you can't pick up on. There's a gap between you and that person. You see, we are made to have relationships in person. The fact that we uh, have to look through a screen now and we have to interact with people from a distance, it's hard. It's hard to really, truly know someone. And maybe you've experienced this. Uh, one of the weird things is that if you're like on FaceTime with someone or you're on a Zoom call with someone, as soon as you hit that red button, it's like they disappear, right? When, when you're in person with somebody, you at least have like a couple of minutes to say goodbye and to kind of prep yourself for them not being there. But when you're FaceTiming someone or you're on a video call with someone, and you're having a good conversation, you're connecting with them, and then you hit that red button, it's like they cease to exist, and you're just left in this weird place of, like, loneliness. I think if you, if you think about it, that's kind of how it feels with God sometimes. 
And maybe if you were honest, that sometimes uh, you kind of feel this connection with God, maybe uh, in a Sunday church service, or maybe uh, when you're talking with a friend or kind of seeing some prayer requests answered, you feel that God is kind of there, but then you kind of leave that space and life feels different. You kind of wonder on Monday if God really is there like he was yesterday. It's kind of like you hit the red button and all of a sudden you're kind of left wondering, uh, where is God in my everyday life? He seems kind of distant, and, and you kind of maybe feel like you're communicating to him through a screen, and he's not quite there. You kind of see him, you kind of wonder what he's doing, but for the most part, it feels like he's disappeared. This is what John is saying in John chapter 1, verse 18. He's saying no one has ever seen God. We're kind of left wondering who God is and what God is like. We're, we're looking at him through a screen. We're looking at him with some distance, and we're just kind of guessing and wondering, what is he thinking? What is he feeling? What does he want me to do? What does he think about me? We're left guessing. This is uh, kind of what it feels like. But then John says in the middle of this, he says in verse 14, the word Jesus becomes flesh and dwells among us, and we have seen his glory. This changes everything. You see, John is picking up on this uh, really significant idea in the Old Testament. And if you're new to the Bible, I'll explain this idea for you. Last week, we talked about how Moses led the people out of Egypt, and he led them to Mount Sinai. And on that mountain, God gave Moses the law, what we commonly think of as the Ten Commandments. It kind of laid out for them everything that they were supposed to do, everything that God wanted them to do to live a good life with him. But along with those Ten Commandments, God also sent instructions for them to build a tent. They called it the tabernacle. It was this big tent that was designed to be in the middle of their encampment. So everyone had a tent as they were traveling through the wilderness. And in the center of their uh, community was the tabernacle. It was where God was. And so you always knew where God was. And he was saying, I'm going to be with you in the middle of this. Now, there were some advantages to that but there are also some disadvantages to that. I mean, one advantage, if you think about it, is if you ever wanted to know where God was, all you had to do was open up your tent flap, and you had to look to the center of the camp, and you would see in the center of the camp this big tent. And if there, were, if there was light and kind of fire around it, you knew that God was there. But the disadvantage of this was that you could never actually go in that tent. You could never actually go in and see God or meet with God. There were always layers of curtain and tent and procedure to get to God. In fact, there's only one person who was allowed to go into that tent and only once a year. The high priest was allowed to go in, but only after he made some animal sacrifices to cover over all of his wrongdoing, all of his inability to follow the Ten Commandments. And when he did those sacrifices, then he could go in and he could experience who God was, but only once a year. And so you knew where God was and you knew uh, kind of what, when God wanted to move and, and all these kinds of things, but you also couldn't really see God. You couldn't really see what was inside the tent. You couldn't really see who God was and God's glory. There were always layers of screens and curtains and fabric and procedure between you and God. And so when John says the word became flesh and dwelt among us, he's saying that something radical has happened. Something significant has now changed. He says that Jesus comes to us, and he comes to us as we are and where we are. Jesus comes to us as we are and where we are. See, he comes to us as we are. When, when John says the word became flesh, what he's saying is Jesus becomes fully and completely human. He becomes fully and completely human. He doesn't just look like a human. He actually is human. This is what Christians have called the incarnation of God. Now, that's a, a big word, but the way that I remember this is this way. I took a couple of years of Spanish in high school, and maybe you know Spanish, or maybe you're bilingual, and this will make sense to you, but uh, the Spanish word for meat is carne. So whenever I think of the incarnation, whenever I think of what John is talking about here, it's like this idea that Jesus put himself in meat. He wrapped himself in human flesh and blood. He became a real human in the incarnation. Now, this is amazing because what this means is that uh, God is not just distant. He's not just kind of an idea. It's not just kind of like the wind blowing through a field. Now God is here in person. He becomes fully and completely human. 
which means when Jesus is born, he is born in a completely human kind of way. I know a way in a manger says that uh, the little Lord Jesus, no crying he made, he probably cried a lot because that's what babies do. Uh, He lived a fully and completely human childhood where he learned things. He lived a full and complete, probably a little awkward adolescence as a full human. And then when he grew up, he worked a real job and he sweat real sweat and he earned a real living because he was fully and completely human. You see, when God becomes flesh, when Jesus becomes human, we now have a God who has walked every step of life with us. A God who understands everything that we've gone through. A God who has experienced human pain. He's experienced what it means to hurt and what it means to work. He is a God that understands us because he meets us as we are. And even more than that, think about this. When Jesus became fully human, he didn't come as like a generic Ken doll kind of mannequin, right, with no features. He came fully in a culture. He looked like a thoroughly Jewish man who spoke Aramaic and Hebrew, who ate the food that people in that culture ate. He understood the language and the the references of the people in that culture. He came fully and completely human in a way that people could be familiar with, in a way that they could understand what he was saying. God comes to us as we are. But not only that, not only does the word become flesh, but John also says that he dwells among us. He uses the same word for tabernacle here. He's saying just like in the Old Testament, when God uh, lived in this camp in the middle of the community, now God is again living among us. He is tabernacling among us. And through Jesus, we can see God's glory, all of it. Now, that was something that you couldn't see in the tabernacle. So so what has changed? What has happened that now we can see God's full glory in Jesus? See, the reason why Jesus has to become fully human is because what he is going to do is he's going to offer his fully human life as a perfect, permanent, last sacrifice for us. You see, with the tabernacle, the priest would, would kill some animals and the blood would kind of cover over their sins, uh, but they had to keep doing that every year because they kept sinning and, and it was just kind of a symbol, it was a picture. But what Jesus does for us is that he offers his life in our place. And so when he goes to the cross, when he gives his life for us, he is performing the last perfect sacrifice. In fact, this is why uh, in the story of Jesus' crucifixion, One of the most incredible things that happens is in the temple, the moment that Jesus dies, the curtain that separates people and God rips from top to bottom. It's like the last screen, the last barrier between us and God is now done away with, and now it is open and anyone can experience who God is through Jesus. This is why later in the New Testament, they would refer to Jesus as that curtain, That he is the way that we get to God. He is the way that we experience who God is. Because in Jesus, now God's glory comes to dwell with us. And so if we want to know uh, who God is, it's through Jesus. If we want to know what God is like, it is through Jesus. If we want to know uh, what God would do in any situation, it's by looking at Jesus. Because it's in Jesus that God's glory dwells completely. You see, Jesus meets us as we are. And he meets us where we are. He becomes human and then dwells among us. And through him, we get to experience and understand all that God is. Now, if you're listening to this and you're not yet a Christian, maybe you have some really big questions about Jesus and you're still kind of making sense of this in your head. This is what this means for you. You know, in order to experience who God is, in order to know God, there has to be some kind of forgiveness of sin, some kind of sacrifice. That's what God set up at the very beginning. And so when you become a Christian, it is seen that Jesus made that sacrifice for you. And it is trusting and receiving what he offers. Trusting and receiving his forgiveness for you. Without that, there's no way that you can really know God. Because there's no way that your, your sin and your wrongdoing can ever be dealt with. But because of Jesus's love and forgiveness for us and offering himself in our place, we can now know God fully and completely. 
So becoming a Christian is believing this reality, is trusting Jesus, that he paid the last perfect sacrifice for you, that you now no longer have to fear God. You now no longer have to wonder what God is like or how God feels about you because he has secured that for you by paying the price one last time. In fact, uh, Romans would say that God demonstrates his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He gave his perfect human life for us so we could know who God is. This is what it means to become a Christian, is to receive Jesus' sacrifice on your behalf. But the fact that Jesus becomes human, this changes so much about how we think about our world, about how we think about ourselves, about how we think about our neighborhood. I mean, of all of the things that we could talk about, I just want to talk about two things that this changes for us. You see, Jesus becomes fully and completely human. And this means that your body matters. A lot of times religion is kind of like this idea of escaping this world to get to some sort of perfect spiritual world. Right, that this world is kind of dirty and broken, but if I could just go home, right, if I could just get to heaven, if I could just get to nirvana, then that would be what I'm supposed to do. But Jesus reverses all that. He leaves heaven. He leaves uh, the spiritual world with God, and he comes into our physical world, and he lives a perfect human life, which means that this world matters. The stuff of your body matters. That Jesus doesn't just want, to, uh, want you to follow him with your head or with your heart, but also with your body. And what you put into it, and what you do with it, and how you feel, and, and how you exercise, and what you eat, and what you do with your sexuality, all of these things Jesus has something to say about because he becomes fully and completely human. So your body matters to following Jesus. But the other big thing is this, that because Jesus becomes human, and because he, he dwells among us, our neighborhood matters to Jesus. And in fact, the message paraphrase would say that the word became flesh and moved into the neighborhood. You see, when Jesus becomes human, he doesn't come as a generic Ken doll mannequin. He becomes a human in a particular culture, looking like that culture and speaking like that culture and, and using the references and eating the food and walking the streets and, and attending the schools of that culture. You see, when God wants to communicate his love to us, he doesn't broadcast it from across the country. He doesn't tweet it. He doesn't live stream it. Instead, he sends Jesus into a particular place to walk among people and to live in that culture and to communicate the good news of the kingdom of God in that culture. You see, this is why as a church, we're so committed to this idea of being a neighborhood-focused church. Because just as Jesus became human in a particular place and spoke the language and ate the food and walked the streets and attended the schools of that particular place, he dwelt among them. So as we follow Jesus, we will do the same thing. We will live in a particular place and, and speak the language of people and, and understand the references and eat the food and invest in the schools and buy the homes in the neighborhood where we are going to live out the kingdom of God, because this is what Jesus did for us. And it's in doing that that people come to understand who Jesus is. As we live and dwell among people, following Jesus who did this first. And doing this in a way that makes sense for people in this context, in this culture. Just like Jesus met us as we are, where we are. In fact, this is so important. We're going to spend all of 2020, or 2021 talking about this idea. We're going to launch into 2021 talking about what it means to dwell in the neighborhood, what it means to bless the block that you live on, to invest in the culture and the place that you live, because this is what Jesus did for us. He meets us as we are, where we are, no longer through screens, no longer distant from God, no longer through a curtain, but in person dwelling among us, allowing us to experience all that he is, seeing all of God's glory in the face of Jesus. This is who Jesus is. God with us, among us, human, inviting us to experience all that he is. So my prayer for you as we approach this Christmas Eve is that you would know the God who is with you, the God who, uh, who is human like you, 
And the God who invites you to experience the fullness of his glory in the face of Jesus. Let me pray for us this morning. God, you are not distant from us. As often as it feels like uh, we kind of go from Sunday experiencing you to then Monday, like the, the red button of FaceTime has been turned off and we're kind of wondering where you are and what you're doing. You cross that boundary. You meet us as we are where we are. And so God, for the one who is here who, uh, who doesn't know who you are, who hasn't yet experienced uh, what it means to see Jesus and to trust Jesus, would you even in this moment uh, show them the love that you have for them in sending Jesus to take their place, the last perfect sacrifice, so that they could know who you are fully. And God, will we be people who live such lives in this neighborhood, in our, in our blocks, in our part of town, that people wonder what's going on, and that they would hear uh, from our, our mouths and see in our lives the good news of Jesus in a way that's lived out that makes sense for them. So that just as you came to us as we are where we are, that we would follow you in doing the same. And that as a result of this, your name would be known. The name of Jesus who meets us right where we are. We pray all these things in his name. Amen.